I trust this um, aircraft that we're looking at on the screen at the moment is, is um, mostly known to you. This is the uh, X-47B. It was a uh, United States Navy um, unmanned combat aerial vehicle demonstrator. And uh, I, I've picked uh, just uh, a few aspects of it that I think are quite remarkable. The, the main the main thing to take away from this is that it's autonomous. It's not remotely piloted, it's autonomous. Um, this UCAV is especially notable because it's the first UAV uh, to be catapulted and so far the largest to operate autonomously from a US aircraft carrier. Autonomous launch and recovery, wave-offs, touch-and-go landings to simulate failure to catch the wire, operations in the pattern with manned aircraft, and what I believe to be a very impressive autonomous air-to-air -air refuelling um, capability, in, in this case behind a, a um, civilian uh, aircraft um, with a centerline um, hose and drogue refuelling capability, not remotely piloted went up behind the aircraft, um, engaged the, uh, the basket and plugged successfully multiple times. Uh, by all accounts, this demonstrator program has been very successful and, and uh, although the program is now over, um, there is a follow-on program uh, for the US Navy um, which is known as the Unmanned Carrier Launched Airborne Surveillance and Strike Program, and um, we appear, we, we think that uh, aircraft will be fielded uh, in the early 2020s, maybe 22, 23. Um, notwithstanding the success of this program, there is evidence uh, that uh, there is evidence of quite some resistance within the US Navy to a UCAV and to this particular. Um, platform in particular. I, I think it worthy to note that in the USAF, the MQ-9 Reaper has been in operational service since 2007. James Holmes, writing in the National Interest in 2015, noted two opposing theories on technological progress. On the one hand, he refers to science philosopher Karl Popper, who stated that a hypothesis is developed to explain or predict reality and then is tested to try and falsify or disprove the theory through rigorous examination and experimentation. The opposing theory, Holmes believes, comes from Thomas Kuhn, who stated that scientific progress takes place through a fractious political process. Notably, Kuhn observes that the existing doctrine and culture have gatekeepers with vested interests in preserving the status quo. Now as a pilot, or as a former pilot, I can understand why there may be a level of resistance to the increasing introduction of unmanned aircraft into military service. So far, there's little evidence that UAV or UCAVs have displaced pilots, but I think this is only a matter of time. The answer to why pilots would reject the notion of unmanned vehicles appears obvious, but there is a more complex set of issues at play. The aim of my presentation today is to discuss the relationship between organisational culture and technological innovation, and I will borrow as an example from a worthy historical um, uh, capability. So why talk to you about culture? Well, apart from the fact that I was asked to, uh, culture affects how we embrace technological innovation or indeed whether we embrace innovation at all.
I'm just going to give you uh, a few definitions and some context. In 2016, Klaus Schwab, founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, famously described the fourth industrial revolution. He defines the fourth industrial revolution as the advent of cyber physical systems involving new capabilities for people and machines. He notes that the fourth industrial revolution represents entirely new ways in which technology becomes embedded within societies and even human bodies. Examples include genome editing, new forms of machine intelligence, breakthrough materials and approaches to governance that rely on cryptographic methods such as blockchain. There are many consequences of this revolution. Not only will the ADF need to remain savvy regarding the new opportunities that new technologies will present, but we will also need to be alert to the fact that the technologies are becoming increasingly prolific. Much of the technology will be within the means to all, bar the poorest of nations, and our reliance on holding a technological edge in the face of numerically superior regional forces <coughs> will eventually fail to provide us the advantages that we seek. And that is why we must know and understand our military culture and the subcultures within. Emerging technology and the innovation which combine to bring us new capability and military advantage will succeed only if we remain open to change and alert to our biases. On the subject of biases, Culture, uh, cultural inertia or the resistance to change that lies within the military's warfighting concepts can help to prevent the whimsical pursuit of technology for the sake of technology. But equally, it can stymie the progress of warfighting fighting capability and leave one military force at a significant disadvantage in the face of another, which has embraced new technology and developed supporting doctrine to maximise the effect of its employment. A useful definition of organisational culture that I refer to is offered by Edgar Schein. So just keep that in mind. So, I talked about a historical case study, the origins of Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg is often thought to be a land warfare concept first introduced by Hitler's invading army, initially in Poland in 1939, and then very successfully employed westwards across France and the Low Countries in 1940. However, its origins lie not in World War II and not even in the Spanish Civil War of the late 1930s, where technological aspects were in fact tested. Blitzkrieg's origins are in the First World War, and arguably the origins lie with the British Army. Let's look at the conditions underpinning the way the war on the Western Front in the First World War were, uh, were unfolding. The Western Front was defined by trench warfare, stalemate and mass slaughter. Three particular innovations have irrevocably changed the land battle. Machine guns, the increased rates of, of fire and accuracy of artillery and aircraft. Open field manoeuvres that commanders on both sides would have planned for in the lead up to World War I had become impossible. Trenches, barbed wire and the new weaponry now favoured defence over attack. When significant breaches in the front were retrieved, they were all too often plugged with reinforcements who were supported by artillery while attacking, attacking forces were estranged from their <coughs> own. Static machine gun positions in defensive um, placements were more than, uh, correction, more than made up for the manoeuvrability of an infantryman carrying a bolt action rifle. In 1915, efforts were underway to build a new machine that would combine manoeuvrability, firepower and protection and the British Mark I tank was born. First used with mixed success in September 1916, the Mark I male, and there were two versions, the other being a female, was nearly 30 tonnes, powered by a 70 kilowatt engine 
78 kilowatt engine. It had a range of 37 kilometres at a speed of 4.5 kilometres per hour. It was armed with two six-pound guns and three machine guns. Proponents of the tank included the first commander of the tank corps, Brigadier General Hugh Ellis, and his chief of staff, Lieutenant Colonel JFC Fuller, who later became Major General Fuller and a noted strategist and military historian. British tanks were first used in 1916 with mixed success as they were used in small numbers and had reliability issues. They were used again in the Battle of Passchendaele in autumn of 1917 in unusually wet conditions and struggled with the mud. But in late 1917, Ellis presented, correction, Ellis pressed for their massed use in the Battle of Cambrai. Used in this way, Ellis achieved considerable success, but it was not a simple matter of superior technology. The method in which technology was employed was an essential ingredient. Strategist and historian Basil Liddell Hart later referred to the method used as the indirect approach. And this combination of technology and technique eventually became known as Blitzkrieg. Liddell Hart referred to this particular um, tactic eventually as the expanding torrent. We now view the use of massed armour as used in this way as standard operational doctrine, but in World War I, both the technology and the technique for employment attracted considerable resistance. Despite the slaughter and stalemate which had dominated through years of war already, Field Marshal Haig willingly endorsed the obscene carnage of the battles of the Somme in 2016 and Passchendaele in 2017. He, like many of the planners at that time, continued to believe that the big breakthrough would eventually come. Another example of the urban definition of insanity. There was an inclination to do the same thing over and over again in the expectation that a different result could be achieved. Attitudes continued to hold that the new technologies like aircraft and tanks would be little more than a distraction to the main effort. To be fair, there were usually some changes to each new assault, but they tended to be minor variations or simply a matter of increasing the scale, such as attacking across a wider front or conducting an artillery bombardment that lasted longer prior to the infantry assault. The prevailing culture held the superiority of infantry as the main weapon. Clearly though, the use of armour eventually came to be accepted, perhaps not universally, but to the point where it was used decisively in the summer and autumn campaigns of 1918. Indeed, one of the most famous battles, the Battle of Hamel, involved Australians and New Zealanders fighting for the first time alongside the US Army and that included the use of British tanks and aircraft. By the end of the war, both Britain and France had fielded thousands of tanks between them, which contributed to the Allies prevailing. And yet, despite having directly <coughs> witnessed their effective use, Germany fielded only very few. They produced only 20 of their own A7V tanks, and occasionally they included captured British or French tanks in their attacks. The initial successes of the German stormtrooper tactics saw elite infantry formations rushing forward fast and deep into enemy territory with close support from artillery and armed aircraft. These tactics adhered to the same principles of indirect attack and the use of mobility, as did the British use of armour. But there was no widespread acceptance or urgency to adopt the tank. Now, let's move forward 20 years. It's Poland in 1939. By the time of the invasion, the positions had changed very significantly. French General Armengaud of the French Army de l'Air reported on his observations of the German assault on the Polish forces to the general headquarters in France. His description captures the essence of Blitzkrieg. Despite having pioneered the initial successful use of massed armour 20 years earlier, 
British and French forces were not able to reproduce their own versions of the Blitzkrieg in 1940, much less defend against them. And while we can ponder the many reasons why, I think we can assume that there remained institutional resistance to the use of armour. Perrett quotes Major General Sir Lewis Jackson of the British Army from November 1919, addressing the Royal United Services Institute. The tank proper was a freak. The circumstances which called it into existence were exceptional and not likely to occur again. If they do, they can be dealt with by other means. Indeed, we know that Britain neglected ongoing development of the tank after World War I preferring instead to believe that the infantry and cavalry would remain the primary battlefield combat branches. Anecdotally, throughout the 1920s, the British Army spent more on fodder than on fuel. Now, I think it perverse that having pioneered the use of armour and the tank during World War I, British incorporation of armour between the wars was half-hearted. Meanwhile, the Germans, having little more than dallied with it during World War I, subsequently saw the potential and made armour the centrepiece of their attack on Europe and North Africa. Now, if we had longer, we could actually discuss the fact that Germans, too, struggled internally to convince their war planners that armour should be the centrepiece. Nonetheless, they did take this on. And the German Panzer Corps invasion of Poland was led by General Heinz Guderian, known as the architect of the Panzerwaffe, in an interesting twist, Guderian credited the writings of J.F.C. Fuller and Basil Liddell Hart as being the main inspiration for his leadership in the development of Blitzkrieg as a technique in the German army. It's worthy, I think, to ponder the cultures of the respective armies and how these cultures embraced or struggled with the incorporation of armour and its advantages. The stilted acceptance and incorporation of armour in the early 20th century is not really an unfamiliar story. Similar stories abound regarding the initial use and incorporation of aircraft. Early employment saw the aircraft as little more than a surveillance platform. And in the maritime, the larger navies initially struggled to accept that the battleship would cease to be the capital ship, the main strike platform, as the aircraft carriers grew in size and number. Now, there's another debate growing about whether the aircraft carrier can remain the principal maritime strike platform, given the weapons being developed under the banner of the anti-access area denial um, uh, strategy. Um, and I refer to weapons such as the hypersonic glide weapon. <coughs> Today's seminar is about emerging technologies and their influence on air and space power, which is a long way from the lumbering behemoth, like a 1918 tank overweight and undergunned, but humans are still humans and the institutional biases which affected the militaries in 1918 continue to affect us now. To some degree, the traits that create the conditions that make for good soldiers, sailors, airmen and officers often conspire to slow the adoption of change, especially when our identity appears to be threatened. Andrew Hill, writing in the US Army journal Parameters, observes that the military is a very significant and somewhat conservative bureaucracy and offers an explanation as to why innovation faces opposition from within. Notably, eventual incorporation of the innovation, if it is to occur, requires organisational change. For the larger innovations, this requires a change of the military's organisational culture. Elting Morrison writes about the natural instinct to protect oneself and observes a plain truth when he states that the military organisations are built around weapon systems. Hence we should expect no less than a defensive posture from those groups most threatened by the proposal to introduce new technology that lessens the role of a particular weapon system or worse, removes the human from that role entirely. Having given you what I believe to be a worthy historical example of the impact of military culture on the adoption of emerging technology, and noting the problem is not new and probably prevalent, we might ask, so what? 
The so what, I believe, is that the ADF appears to be in the midst of the most fundamental change to our tools of war that we've experienced in generations. And that change is being driven not by the pursuit of military technology through the defence industry, but principally by the innovation and adoption of technology that is essentially the progeny of the industrial and commercial realm. This is not a passing fad. This is a new industrial revolution. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>